Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Butterfly Effect podcast. And today it is analysis two of Little Hope. We're going to jump straight into it with the curator scene. Obviously, he's having a little chat with us, reflecting on what happened in the first part. He even talks about like some of the theories that the characters had, that some of the characters had. I wanted to put that across to you, mate. Like, do you remember in your first like blind playthrough? Did you have any particular theories that were going on, you know, post? Because obviously we've just seen Andrew and Angela have their first encounter with, like, the witch trial characters, you know. Did you have any idea or thinking on potentially what the twist was going to be or, like, where this plot was going to go? Not at all. My, my brain was all over the shop, to be honest, because, like, you know, we came into this game and it very much had that witch and Salem thing about it, so... I kind of had my mind like it might be something supernatural. Um, I still was under the illusion that the bus driver was probably out there somewhere. So I was like, oh yeah, trying to find him. Um, but yeah, like, and, and then these flashback things, no idea what that was really about. Um, sometimes I do this thing though, where I, I try not to fully guess what's going on. So sometimes you just sit back and you enjoy the ride, you know, and then you take the surprise, take you the full brace, you know. So yeah, I, I just was very much kind of like, yeah, anticipating it, but not really predicting at this point, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I get that. I think for me, I think I was pretty much in the, the mindset of, yeah, in a very similar position. I think actually I did say this in the other stream though, that later on I come to the theory that it was somehow like a time loop thing and the characters were trapped and they were just sort of reliving, they were moving through time, but they were like constantly in the town of Little Hope. But um, that didn't really obviously go anywhere, given what the actual twist was. But, um, I mean, we then move on. Not a lot really happens. We take over as John, or at least in the uh, Curator's Cut version, we do We do some road walking. And this is another talking point that I wanted to put to you, mate. It comes back to an earlier video that we did when we did the Dark Pictures Anthology like, survey quiz a while back. It's basically that it's this bit that happens. You're walking as John and, like, there's a jump scare like a deer runs across the road and there's another instance later on where there's like a mannequin that falls down in like that museum house um and i was just sort of wondering like some of those scenes to me and especially like the road walking ones they do feel kind of slow and they can be a little bit dead and i think the reason being is that you sort of know that you're not really in jeopardy even when those jump scares happen so like with that in mind, do you still warm to the idea of like not having death by exploration or like not having any risk at all like when you're wandering around as these characters or do you think in season two that actually more jump scares, more risk of, you know, screwing up while you're physically playing as the character would actually be a good thing? It's tough to say because like, you could probably feel like imagine if you're playing on the hardest difficulty like you did on your stream mate and then like mm. you're just doing some road walking and something gets you when you're like thin on the ground you've already lost maybe three characters and you're walking and then something else comes out and gets you and that wouldn't have happened in a different video game it's different and i'm open to the idea of something different kind of like you know being in a, in these sort of video games because i i strongly think they need to kind of shake up the formula just you know even if it's like a minor amount each time but yeah um death by exploration kill open to the idea not sure if it has longevity to it potentially so like yeah maybe for like one game like maybe when we're in directive 80 20 like you know you can get some threats just out when you're hovering around like outside your spacecraft or something i'd be open to that but yeah, like, uh, I, I think the whole thing you mentioned as well there, mate, about how the road scenes can be quite tedious. And, you know, I am kind of like the basher of Little Hope, you know, between the both of us. So, like, I especially feel that. I feel like maybe that's just uh, not a flaw aimed at Little Hope per se, but choice-based games in general. Because we take our beloved one, like Until Dawn, for example, and you've got, like, the Mike sanatorium scenes. I remember feeling really terrified but really enthralled on my blind playthrough. It's only when you do all the replays that you know there's no jeopardy. So mm. it's like great on a blind playthrough, horrendous on a replay, especially like yourself. You said you trophy hunted for this game. 
and you said how much of a slog it was to get the trophy for Little Hope with all the road walking you did, mate. Oh yeah, no, it, it really was a slog. And the thing is, is that, and I've, this actually leads very nicely to the next point, which I'll write back to you for. But the characters reach the bridge, and um, it then comes this like dialogue scene, uh, and it just, uh, I'm not gonna lie, like when the characters stop, there's not a hell of a lot to look at anyway, is there? Because it's just a road, there's trees, there's a bit of fog, there's nothing really to catch you. So you've got to focus on the characters in this game. And we've already said that the characters aren't great themselves, but they arrive at this bridge and they're starting to talk again. They're talking about splitting up. And I mean, I'm going to throw it over to you, mate, because you could probably put it a lot better and have stronger feelings about it than me. But like, what are your sort of like feelings at this point when they're talking about splitting up again, they start bickering again like they did in the first part. And it's a very sort of stop starty thing with this plot. Like, I just want to see what your overall thoughts are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mate. <laughs> oh, boy. It's one of those ones where, like, I came into this sort of analysis with an open mind and I watched the playthrough and, like, I really want to change my opinion on this game. I really want to like it. And then the characters open their mouths and I just can't, mate. I can't do it. Like, you know, there was a little bit earlier where, like, you know, John says, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go across the bridge first. And then there's just a full second, like, zoom into Angela's face. And then, like, after this really awkward pause, she goes, Wait, I'll come too. And it's like, okay, that's just like five seconds that didn't need to be that long. <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I think the bit you're referring to, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit to you earlier, is that, like, yeah, Taylor has just this really weird moment where she's like, Oh, this is exactly how horror movies go. And then later on, she says, Oh, yeah, we should split up. And when John replies, I mean, this was optional, but you picked the dialogue. Oh, haven't you ever seen those horror movies? Even though she just mentioned it two minutes earlier. And she said, yeah, those horror <laughs> movies are dumb. And I'm just like, it just goes back on itself. And the, the dialogue's very plain and vanilla. And when it tries to mm. kind of like come out of its comfort zone a little bit, just none of the la lines like land for me. I don't know if you feel the same. For me, yeah. I mean, the the writing, yeah, it's not. And th this is the thing. It's what I was literally just saying just now. Because of the location, because there's nothing else really grabbing your attention. So, like, if you, I'm trying to think of, like, in The Devil in Me, for example, you've got that like, things around the hotel you can look at while they're talking. Or even on the walk up to the hotel, you've got the nice lighthouse, the nice scenery. With this, like, they've gone for the atmosphere, which I think is great. But the emphasis is on the characters so much because it's so foggy, you can't really look at anything else but the characters. And you do get those moments where <sighs> the only way I can describe it, and it is a criticism, it's almost as if the characters aren't talking to one another. It feels like it's being recorded in a studio and the actors aren't actually looking at the other actors when they're, you know, performing their role. Because it's literally what you said just now, like the little gaps between dialogue sometimes like and i come back to it with the eye contact thing i know it's the thing that we've constantly gone on about but it, it's sort of like they're all stood there with one another but it's like they're not actually conversing with one another it doesn't look like they're actually engaged i don't know how else to describe it i hope you do get what i mean but then on top of that the dialogue as well so like you're looking at the characters and the dialogue's not the strongest and the facial animations and everything just blends together and it just doesn't quite work for me. I'm not as sold by everything as I have been in other DPA games and I do feel like that's ultimately one of the reasons why it falls short for me overall. I don't know if you can like chime in with anything there if you agree with it. Yeah, I do. And like, like in the last one I said that Supermassive games are clearly capable of writing good characters because we've seen how good they are in like Devil and Me and House of Ashes particularly, you know. Um, but I don't know, I just look at these five characters and I know a lot of our fans like, you know, so, so I know some of them actually really like John, some of them really like Andrew. Um, you know, so like they, they do get their fans and, you know, that's great. But I, I just like wish I could... Um, feel the same and I just wish like I can understand where that's coming from because they're just so wooden to me I, I just don't care for them 
And like, I feel that's the game's fault. Like, the game needs to make me care for them. But like, they've been throw. They've like, you know, the bus has crashed. They've come off, and like, you know, Taylor and Daniel are bickering. I don't quite know what about <laughs> Angela's just a mean piece of shit. And I'm like, I, I don't know why. Um, Andrew's just like obviously a little wooden, but like I kind of get why with the eventual twist. So I kind of almost forgive it. It's just a shame that Will Poulter's acting kind of had to got, get reduced to that. John, like I say, is the best for me, but like I say, still a C character. And I just, it, it's a shame because like, like you say, it's just foggy roads for me and there's not much to look out or do. Um, the devil in me, like you mentioned, even when you're getting from A to B, they'll throw the odd sort of like quirky bit of dialogue or you'll have the whole Erin sort of like horror scene, you know, with the, the radio and the, the speakers. So the, there are ways around it and they just didn't really use it. And it just ended up being quite a vanilla plain Jane game. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a shame because like I really want to like Little Hope, but to be an excruciating analysis, you know, this is why the channel's here for and I'm just... I'm not being sold by this game on the revisit, mate. Yeah, and I, I do, I do completely get you. I mean, so yeah, obviously the group then split up. We then starting with uh, John and Andrew, and we have this scene where you know they're sort of chatting back and forth. We can see that John's demon is like starting to follow him. We come to this little shack. Now, in my blind playthrough, I absolutely stormed it. But of course, this is lethal difficulty for some reason. I just can't seem to do it. I can't seem to get these heartbeat sequences right. So I do ultimately miss the uh, miss the gun in there. So the curator sort of grills me for that later on. But John absolutely bolts it. Andrew follows, and then we have this funny police station scene, mate. Which again, we're going to come back to the dialogue. I don't know. Uh, on, on the one hand, I find it funny to watch. Does it fit with the tone of the game? No. I did sort of like it, but it's sort of like, you know when you're trying to force the game to do the wrong thing? Like, with this, even people in the chat were telling me, like, don't throw the stone. Just, like, don't throw it and let John, like, have at it with you. So I, try I didn't. I, like, I didn't throw it. I didn't throw it. And I just find it funny, like the, the dialogue, it is kind of cringe, but it's, I don't know, I find it funny at the same time how John's like, are you nervous? Are you nervous about throwing a stone at the window? And I don't know why, why this is dragged out so much, like why are these two characters like bickering over throwing a stone? Like you just get on with it, wouldn't you? You just throw the stone, like it's really not that hard. The fact that John has to then take over just to throw a, just to throw a stone through the window, I did find it quite funny. Yeah, it's not like you're picking a lock or it's like a strength exercise. You're straight up just throwing a rock at a window. And it, yeah, I, I, I watched you play for it. It did make me laugh, mate. But yeah, we then move across to... Because uh, I think in my one, I know that actually... Isn't this the point? I think Angela can actually go with Andrew and John. But in my one, she chose to go with uh, Daniel and Taylor. And the point here, they, they approach this school... And um, the gates are locked, so you can't ultimately go in, so you circle around to that little playground. But I saw that, I was thinking earlier on, I was like, it's such a missed opportunity. I think that if they were able to go into the school, that would be such a good horror location. But I don't know, there is something about like a school at night, especially when you've got like a little girl running around, like laughing and, you know, doing the ring a ring of roses stuff. I think that could have been such like a chilling and memorable location because I know we've talked about in a previous video that Little Hope, it does sort of lack a standout location, you know, as compared to the other games. But yeah, I just, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on that, mate, like potentially they could have done something there because I know we're fans of like Doctor Who and there's that one Doctor Who episode where they're like... I think it's like when David Tennant's doctor sees like Sarah Jane again and like they go back to the school at night and you've got like those bat creatures in there and it could be like quite scary like good for horror moments you know yeah and um Life is Strange 1 have the kind of slightly creepy school scene at night when you and Chloe break into Wells's office and then Oof. like you've got Walking Dead season 1 where like in episode 4 they go into like Crawford which is like you know a school and it does create some good horror moments. So yeah, yeah, no, I would have really liked that. It is a shame they actually 
kind of kept us outside so much and when we did go into buildings it was often like a quick in and out job for like a building that just was slightly disheveled and not really noteworthy so yeah no it could have really have used like with a location like that yeah i've got this down nick because it is like a slight jump but there is that shop later on yeah where like daniel you can go in can't you you can go in i think either from below or you can like climb up and you have to like borrow taylor's phone to go in and even he says himself that this has been a complete waste of time and even like as the player i'm sat there and i'm like what did we find in here? Like, we found clearly, like, a clue or two. But all you really do is just jump through a hole, walk round the aisles of the shop, come to a door, and then you have one of those, you know, flashbacky scenes again. And then they're out, and I'm like, well, I feel like they could have done something with the school. I think that that would have been a better location to, you know, revisit there. And I think, actually, talking about those little flashback scenes... I was going to say this later on, but while we're talking about it, I'll say it now. But while they do get repetitive, I do think it loses its sting after a few times. You know, where like it's quite clear that a jump scare is coming. You can just tell. Like, we've played these games long enough now, where like there's sort of a slight pause or like the camera zooms in slightly. But the next thing you know, there's an arm grabbing you and it goes, Aah! and then you know, you're sort of taken back to the past or whatever. Um, as repetitive as they get, I'm glad those scenes are in there because I sort of wonder what Little Hope would have been without them. And I'll bang that point home again, is that, and I think this is where it, the mind boggles because the characters in the witch trial segments, whether that's Amy, whether that's, uh, is it Tabitha, even like the little girl, um... They're all far more stronger characters and the performances are better and it just makes you think, do I have to go back? Like, do I have to go back to the present day? Because I think this whole setup is a lot better than what we're getting served up otherwise, you know? Yeah, no, I, I get that because for me, um, I've criticised the dialogue a lot, but I've got it down here. I really liked Amy's voice acting, like the Angela flashback. You know, she's getting accused for being a witch and she has so much conviction in her voice. And yeah, obviously there's like, you know, that kind of old timey British accent with it as well. But like, I actually got something out of that character. Like I really felt for her, you know, when she's like, you know, about to get executed and stuff. And like, she's pleading to Carver that, you know, she's righteous. And I, I thought it was a really stellar performance, to be honest, mate. But as you, you mentioned as well, the point which I wanted to go back to is like these scenes losing their sting. And I, I, I do think you're right. And I think it's because this chapter alone, which we're covering in this video, it did feel very much like walk, get a flashback, walk, get a flashback. And it was almost like the storytelling was in the flashbacks. So the mm. main drive that we have in the present day just almost served as kind of like kind of like carriers you know they were just going from a to b to unlock these flashpoints so it's almost like the story was in the flashbacks so those bits were kind of like you know little kind of juicy nuggets of like where you wanted the story to go and the plot was advancing but when it came back to the present day i almost feel like it was left at the door a little bit and it they suffered as a result of the style that's such a good point that's such a good point yeah yeah, because it, it really is, isn't it? You're just wandering around, like, look, waiting for these moments to occur to then try and advance the plot. I mean, talking about the flashbacks themselves, if I'm going to my blind playthrough, I think it was the one where you're in the playground and, like, you know, you're with Mary and Carver, like, hits Mary. Uh, where I was like, okay, you know, it's clearly this guy. I'm going to blame this guy. Because... It's, it's, you know, there is that scene, though, later on where I think, is it when uh, Amy gets condemned? And, you know, clearly Mary's acted up, you know, under Carver's instructions, act like the devil's in you or whatever. And uh, and therefore, you know, it will condemn her. And then she gives this little grin. I was like, oh, you little sod. Like, <laughs> this poor woman's like being condemned now. But. Yeah, the, do you know what I mean? I'm just getting so much more out of those scenes than I am. And I completely agree with you that 
it makes the main cast feel secondary, which is really odd considering that they're supposed to be the main five that are driving this entire thing. One thing I, I will say, mate, though, like, I know I bashed this game a lot. One thing I did quite like, though, and it's as you pointed out earlier, is that Angela could either be with Daniel and Taylor in the playground or she can be with, um, you know, John and Andrew in, in the uh, police station. So it's cool, though, that you do get a bit of uh, variety in where Angela can be based on your choices before. I do like little things like that, and it is really cool from a, like, a replay point of view as well. And it's just the fact as well that her dialogue can actually kind of like have an effect in here as well. So, for example, if like Andrew says, oh, this police station looks familiar, like Angela will question that. Like, why? Have you, are you like a criminal or something? And I was like, OK, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Um, but yeah, like funny enough, like Angela can be at the scene where like Vince goes by in the tunnel and the bicycle. But one thing I did like, though, is that if you do fail that QTE, it's not fatal you don't damage the characters relationships but what does happen is is that you don't see it was vince that went by and i quite like that not all failed qtes have to be fatal or like damaging to relationships this one was just a simple oh you missed a bit of key information there so yeah you know like i say i bash little hope more than the average person but but with that whole scene though mate um i think you've got quite a funny comment on that don't you yeah i mean the yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is, like, they've been clearly walking up one road. Um, they would clearly see if someone overtook them. And for somehow, like, Vince is further up the road, even though he was behind them down in the bar. So, like, just as, like, a geographical little nitpick on my end. But you know what? You've brought up a point there, and it will come up later on. But I'm going to mention it now in case, you know, I forget. But it's that bit again, it's with like Vince on his bike and it's a heartbeat sequence. And it's one of them you know, where you see a shadow and you think, oh God, it's a demon. So they run and they hide behind this bush. And like, if you fail the QTE, like, if you fail the heartbeat rather, um, he'll then glance across and he'll say something like, oh, stupid old man, something like that, and then wander off. And I found it very interesting that actually Failing the heartbeat sequence gave a big indicator as to what was going on. Of course, people could read it as, you know, that he's referring to John because John's hiding behind the bush. But the fact that actually in the bigger context that he's just referring to Anthony because he, everything else is imaginary, he's there by himself. I found that very telling, but I think absolutely like the, I completely agree with the fact that not every failed thing needs to be fatal you know sort of like the devil in me like i like how that actually Charlie's hand can just get crushed i do think that there should have been repercussions later on with it but i do like the fact that charlie's hand does get crushed in that wall and there's like not really a, a let off for it you know in that sequence in the devil in me yeah and you know what while i am saying good things about little hope mate and this is kind of not a time frame sort of question or like a particular point but this is just a general point about the whole game uh one thing that little hope does way better i think than any of like the other 3dpa games is the fact that the character personality traits that you unlock actually have an effect so like you know the overall conclusion of the game so you have things like, you know, Angela, uh, like towards the end, like the whole bridge collapsing, trust Andrew and then kind of gain the whole dismissive trait. John, if he doesn't, if he's not heroic enough, he'll get the uncertain trait. And those all factor into the finale. And I, I do think Little Hope does a very good job of your choices affects their personalities. So yeah, that's, that's one thing I actually really have to praise Little Hope for. Absolutely, and I feel like that is very opposite to Medan. I feel with Medan, um, there are certain things. Obviously, you can get Comrade and you know So and Fliss to kiss or whatever, but it doesn't really impact the grand scheme of things. Um, it, like, the relationships between the characters, even like the you know the proposal, like you know you're still gonna you get a bit of frosty dialogue, but there's not massive amount of swing in it. But it doesn't go anywhere massively, does it? And I think the character traits are so ingrained in the, the plot of Little Hope that I'm glad to see that 
they were explored more because yeah it's something that you know we've seen it in until dawn we've seen it with like the relationship bars and stuff like that i think this is like little hope's way of like sort of doing a similar thing but also being standing on its own two feet you know so yeah i completely get that so yeah obviously we were at the police station they all reconvene after a couple of jump scares from the the telephone which certainly got me um the, the gang reunite and they're back on the road again they come to another bridge scene we have another flashback where we see amy condemned which i think was really dark thinking about it um but then we ultimately come to this choice mate where we do have the first showdown between angela and her demon now do you remember what you did in your first playthrough like because you're playing as andrew right you've got to help either angela or john so do you remember who you pick i remember picking angela only out of the pure you know like that kind of like shit captain mentality of like women and children first <laughs> i just was like yeah. i just felt like she was probably the more frail the one that like needed help more so yeah i, I just naturally went for angela which by the way like if you look at like the choice outcomes i wouldn't have known this but it is the correct call in terms of like potentially something fatal happening as well yeah exactly i mean exact same logic for me i think you can almost add on top of that as well it's sort of spelled out for you literally in the previous scene you can start to learn at this point that there's a bit of a relationship or like with the doppelganger thing going on that that you know that the, it's going for angela and i'm pretty sure there's a premonition or like a, a card you know picture from earlier on as well that shows her getting dragged actually I think that's the one they used in Medan, isn't it? You know, like the gold picture frame in Medan? I swear that they used Angela's death. Where you are like right, and through. I think it's in the trailer as well, and I think that definitely had an influence on my choice now that you reminded me. So yeah, big time, mate. Yeah, so I think a little bit a little bit of that come into it as well. Um, but unless you've got any other points, mate, I'm done for this, because I think it's just a curator scene now, isn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Like the, the only other sort of thing that we haven't really kind of mentioned is, like, I saw that you kind of had some trouble with the heartbeat sequences and that bit, didn't you? And like, as someone who really struggles with heartbeat sequences, who deals with a lot of you fans in the comments saying, I don't get why you struggle with that. Heartbeats are so easy. And admittedly, you're playing on the hardest difficulty. I was playing on medium. But I just kind of wanted your perspective on how it feels to kind of like, fail heartbeats and whether like kind of going forward there's a fear factor in you of oh if a heartbeat sequence comes up i'm screwed it's certainly gonna make me think twice and i don't know where this has come from i don't know if it's because it is lethal difficulty but it feels like that when i do it i'm hitting the button at the point where you know it's between the two things to you know register it and then it just flashes red and i'm like what have i done wrong there like, See, that's how I feel, film. man. That is fucking how I feel. Yeah. Like, when I do it, I swear to God, I'm doing it right. And then I keep failing them, and everyone's like, oh, where he shit. And I'm like, nah, I swear to God, I had it right. And I sound so salty when I say it, but I'm like, does it have to be in the exact middle? Because, like, sometimes I'm maybe slightly to the left, and I wonder if it is, like, something to do with the game's calibration or something. I don't know, but, um, I don't know. Just, uh, Lily says in The Walking Dead Season 1, Misery Loves Company, so it's, it's nice to see you in my world a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing, I mean, I've already I said this in the stream already, but Directive 8020, I'm going back to, you know, the, the, the familiar territory. I'm going back to the, you know, the medium difficulty, because, uh, yeah, as we will discuss in later episodes, you know, that was obviously one of the challenging ones for me, but there's another weird sort of QTE sort of moment thing that completely threw me as well. It's really difficult. So, um, yeah, we will wrap it up there, guys. Of course, that was the analysis for the uh, analysis too for Little Hope. Uh, do let us know what your choices were, what some of your thoughts were on like some of our talking points in this episode and uh, we will read and reply to them. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll catch you next Sunday.